Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We're getting ready to kick things off here. Just want to check to see if everybody can hear us today. And we're not having any audio issues. Please let me know if you're if you can hear me or not. I guess if you're not hearing me, you're not going to know to type in anything in the comments or question section. Okay, super. I hear. So we're getting good audio. Good. Excellent. Well, as I see here, we're just about 30 seconds or so out from the scheduled time to start here, so we'll wait just a moment, but I don't want to delay too much. I appreciate people tuning in an hour later than our normal time this week. This week, we'll be talking about the DJI Phantom 4 RTK workflows, and there's multiple workflows available. So let's go ahead and kind of get this kicked off here, shall we? Let's go ahead and begin. <laughs> So really, what is RTK? And that's a, a question we get quite a bit. Do I need an RTK drone to do such and such mission? And when you get right down to it, RTK is a tec technique used by GNS to improve the accuracy of a, of a standard receiver. Actually, I can't see my screen. And so by being able to improve the accuracy of a standalone GNS receiver, you get to better quality data recorded or metadata recorded with each of your images. And so in the long run, the GNSS satellite transmits signals through the ionosphere and the atmosphere, and these, air, these areas of the atmosphere end up disturbing or slowing down the transmission of these um, signals, and it can deform them just a little bit, or as it says here, perturb them, and that can cause an error in the final calculation. So by having a base station set up on a known point, we're able to take away or calculate for that kind of distortion and ultimately provide the drone flying through the air a more accurate geolocation for each of the GPS or each of the images that's tagged with the unit as it's flying. This diagram I have here is a little bit misleading. It shows a single satellite talking to both the GPS receiver on the drone and then the GPS receiver on the ground, where in actuality we have a network of satellites going overhead in space and that we'll refer to them as GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite Systems. And ultimately, that includes all of the different satellite options, such as GPS, the U.S. constellations, or um, Galileo, the European constellations, or GLONASS, the Russian, etc. And so we have all these different satellites um, orbiting around, talking to the, the two GPS receivers, and then those two GPS receivers are also speaking to each other to accommodate for the amount of offset between their, their clocks and positioning, ultimately giving you a better location. And so when you get right down to it, there's actually three different types of workflows, if you will, that are available with the P4 RTK. And that is you can implement and put just ground control points or GCPs on the ground. You can leverage the RTK or real-time kinematic corrections where you're leveraging a base station at a known base and getting data real-time. And then the last option is something called PPK or post-process kinematic. And that one is a little bit different, whereas the base station is still receiving data from the satellite but the, set, the base station isn't really communicating with the drone live real time. And so the post-processing or the correction is done after the fact, after the flight. So there's a little bit more involved in that particular workflow. And so the one we're gonna focus on here primarily today is the, the center one with the RTK um, option. And so what is the equipment you need if you're gonna go out and do an RTK kind of mission? And so the first thing you need, of course, is the Phantom 4 RTK um, module itself. Yeah, same. Along with, and of course, you need the mobile base station or Wi Fi hotspot to access something called an in trip connection. And then, most importantly, you need to make sure you have sufficient amount of batteries for your um, flight controller, for your drone, for your GPS, for all the different kind of equipment you have out in the field. You want to make sure you have an ample supply of um, SD cards. That's something that always catches me by surprise. I get out in the field and find I've forgotten my SD card or don't have enough. And then, of course, also you want to make sure that you have um, some checkpoints because checkpoints will be a part of this process. And ultimately, it's good if you can create some checklists for yourself. I know I have a, a tendency sometimes to overlook little things. And by having some well-written out checklists for maybe your pre-flight, your post-flight, and the mission itself, you'll find that you have a much smoother time in the field and less issues, if you will.
And so when we're talking about the Phantom 4 RTK, there's actually two different variants of that particular piece of hardware available. The first one's called the Phantom 4 RTK Standard RTK Remote Controller, and that is the remote controller that includes the integrated Android device or tablet there directly on the controller. This works really well with the Phantom 4 RTK setup because on that Android device, there's already a special version of the application called um, Ground Station Pro, or Ground Station R RTK actually is what's installed there. And it's very streamlined and easy to run an operation. But if you're one of those customers or users who's more set on using maybe a third-party app or a Andro or instead of an Android device, you want to use iOS, etc., DJI does have available this item called the Phantom 4 RTK SDK Remote Controller. And that's a, an option that allows you to communicate directly with the P4 RTK drone with the OcuSync technology and also include the RTK information, but then allow you the ability to use your own mobile device, whether it be Android or iOS, and connect those other third-party apps. For today's exercise, we're really focused mainly on the top choice there, the standard RTK remote controller, because that's the one I have access to here in the office to do some testing with. But you'll find that you get good quality results regardless of which drone you use or which um, controller type interface you use. And then, of course, you have to worry about where you're going to get this real-time connection or kinematic correction. And so we have a couple different options for that. The easiest is, of course, the DRTK2 base station that DJI makes. And then another option is that you can go through maybe a third-party um, commercial source, such as I have here, TopNet Live, their um, broadcast um, in-trip network. There's also some other ones, like the folks at Trimble have something called VRS Now. And there's also some other um, publicly available sites that I'll share with folks here in a bit on where you can get some in-trip connections with, um, from. Ultimately, when you get down to it, though, as I mentioned, the DRTK2 base station is really a user-friendly um, device that's very easy to use regardless of what kind of connectivity or where your location is. And so some things to keep in mind that with DRTK2 base, it comes as a, a unit itself with an optional tripod. And the DJI tripod does pair well with DRTK2 carbon pole. I've used some other tripods before that if you're not um, cautious, you could potentially crank down on the carbon pole a little much and cause a, a crack or a deforming there. So I like to use the DRTK2 base and tripod when available. One of the um, downsides to the DRTK2 base is that it currently only allows for you to enter in coordinates in the WGS84 latitude longitude um, format. And actually it's looking for um, decimal degrees. And the Z or Z value it's looking for is not really the standard orthometric height, it's actually looking for an ellipsoidal height when you enter that there. And in the long run also, the DRTK2 base does not generate a Rhinex data file that's compatible with the Opus solution. There is a way to export out um, a solution through what they're calling the DGI Cloud PPK solution, and I'm not going to be touching on that really here today in detail. It's something I need to work through some more myself to get the ins and outs of. But if you do have questions with the Cloud PPK solution, feel free to reach out to us and we'll have a future webinar on that and we'll also be happy to address questions if you have them. And then last but not least, um, you have the option with the DRTK base station to set it up. In an ideal world, you set it up over a known point, but you can also set up that DRTK base station just over an unknown point, but that will ultimately have a, an impact on what we'll call your global accuracy. But just having a DRTK base station collecting over an unknown point will still give you improved geotagging information for the quality of all of your images throughout your project network. And so when you're setting up and working with the DRTK base station, it's a little bit different than some of the traditional um, RTK kind of GPS base stations I've used before. One of the components about this is actually the way it's configured in the height. And the pull you get is actually a two-part pull. You may notice here on the graphic kind of in the center, there's a small knurled area that that's where two different sections of the pull actually screw together and um, are fixed to each other. And so when you have the poles fully mounted together, and if you care carefully lighten down, tighten down that middle lock nut for the two pole pieces, you should ultimately end up with a pole that is 1.8 meters high to your, what we'll call your antenna phase center or the location on the antenna that is being recorded by the GPS. 
And so the other GPS equipment I use has a, a full straight two meter range pole. And I always thought it was a little bit odd that this one came in at just 1.8, but it still works as long as you account for that amount of offset. And I have done measurement checks and have determined that yes, my antenna phase center is 1.8 meters above the point there. And do keep in mind that the value you're going to ultimately enter if you're entering in a point for a known location is you'll enter in the orth or the ellipsoidal height as opposed to an uh, orthometric height into the GPS data for the collector. And when you're operating or working with this DRTK2 mobile base station, there are a number of different what we'll call operating modes available on that depending on what kind of drone or hardware it is you're connecting with. And so when you're looking at the, what I'll call the front of the DRTK base, where the lights are up at the top, where you turn it on and off, those lights and the three buttons there will really indicate what we'll call the status or what's going on with the, the DRTK base. And so the most important one is what we'll call the operating mode or um, the button here, number four, that right hand button. It'll flash consecutively, if you will, the number of times to reflect what mode it's in. And so when we're operating with the Phantom 4 RTK, we want to be up here as it's showing on this table here that we operating mode one would be the mobile base station for the T20, T16, MG, those are more ag drones, or the Phantom 4 RTK or the Phantom 4 multi-spec would be in mode one. And that number four light or the four button would be flashing just one time and then off and then wait a bit and you have one time and off. And then if you were to choose one of the other operating modes by pushing the button a couple of times and holding it in, you can switch in. It'll start beeping then twice or three times, et cetera. But ultimately, the mode you want to be in is just that simple straight operating mode number one. And so using the DRTK base station is certainly an option, but an option that is perhaps even easier yet if you have access to all the required elements would be setting up and just using what's called in-trip. And this is a term that, for me at least, is somewhat new, if you will, and I've heard it for the last couple of years, but on, in the long run of things, in-trip, or the network's transport of RTCM via internet protocol, is a way that they can now broadcast a correction signal over uh, the internet or the cloud, if you will, via uh, Wi-Fi, or a Wi-Fi modem hotspot, et cetera, you can gain access to this correction stream while you're out in the field. There are some pros and cons to this, of course, like a pro to being able to do this with a in-trip connection is that you have a high absolute accuracy and there's ultimately less um, equipment that you have to deal with because you don't have to carry your own base station out into a field or a tripod or any of that equipment. But you do still need to have, of course, a network connection, and so you will be dependent on internet access, which may not be available quite everywhere. And for the most part, there, while there are some free sources of in-trip corrections, oftentimes you may find that there are third-party networks that are set up for a sort of a consumer solution that have a fee associated with it. So things to kind of keep in mind there. And ultimately, to make the system work, you need four different kind of components, if you will. You need to have a base or a network of bases, if you will. You need to have uh, what's called an in-trip caster and then a, a also a client rover. So the caster is a way for the data from the base station to be essentially broadcast over the internet. Your client rover, of course, would be the in-trip compatible GPS, which would be like the DRTK2. And then you need, of course, a cellular modem, whether it be a 4G dongle that you can insert into the remote control of the Phantom 4, or even if you have just an iPhone or Android device that you can hotspot from and then connect with a good network connection or data stream to, to get this in-trip correction as well, that would be sufficient. One thing to keep in mind here, this graphic or the map you see up on the screen right here is a national data 4G LTE coverage map that I was able to locate out on the, the internet um, a couple days ago looking up uscellular.com. But looking at this map here, all the areas in pink and blue are covered with um, data, data coverage here in the United States. And while there aren't a lot of areas that don't have coverage, I know myself just taking drives out from the Denver, Colorado area, you don't seem to have to go too far into the mountains sometimes before your cellular connection can be disrupted. You may not be getting Wi-Fi anymore. And so if you're operating in any of these areas or might be operating in any of these areas here that are more of a grayish or a white color, it's certainly worth considering getting that DRTK2 base station 
That way you can be set up and operating independent regardless of what your internet connections are currently looking like while you're out there operating. Another thing to kind of keep in mind if you're trying to leverage a public course site, maybe for a PPK correction or just um, for other means, is this map here is something I pulled off of the USGS or NGS, I'm sorry, course site that shows a map of all the current course stations all around the US. And we can see here that the area along the East Coast and even a good bit of the Midwest here there in Michigan, Indiana, and even over as far as about Illinois and Iowa have pretty good coverage. But some states like Kansas, South Dakota, North Dakota, et cetera, a few of those are a bit more sparse, and certainly the states aren't super heavily populated, but if you're trying to operate in an area where you're more than what I'd say about six to 12 miles from a core station, you might find that the quality of the correction signal you get will start to decrease as you get farther and farther away and you get what we call a longer baseline. And so again, being able to set up and operate your own DRTK2 base station could be very um, applicable in those kind of situations if you're not really near a current core site. So something to keep in mind. And in this graphic here that I have up on the screen, this is a map that I made myself. I've been doing some research lately, and I hope those folks who are um, attending today can help participate in this a bit. If you'll notice on the screen here, I have a QR code that I've gotten shown on the left-hand side of the map. And if you use your phone, if you will, on that QR code, you should be able to take a photo of it. Let's do a quick test here. It comes up and it goes, it opens up in Safari. And when we do that here, we should be able to actually, let's see, let me escape there for a moment. We can bring up my actual map here that I've created. And this is a map that anyone can currently access. And according to the colorations I have on the screen, if you see a green dot on your state, that means there's some kind of public cores access there, not cores, I'm sorry, um, RTK access. The red states currently don't have a public option and the blue states have access to something called a new NABCO. But let's just go ahead and click here like on Indianapolis or Indiana. And I can see when I click on Indiana, I get a little window pop up here. And if I wanted to, I can follow this link here under where it says link more info. I can click on that and it'll go out and this will actually show me then the Indiana government, Indiana DOT, if you will, their public website where you can get access to in-trip in corrections or other um, GPS correction files. And so if you happen to know of any other in-trip correction sources that I don't have shown here on this map, I'd greatly appreciate if people took some time and could send me an email and I'll keep this map updated and keep adding to it and I'll make it much better. This is the first GIS map I've made in a couple of years and my skills have gotten a little rusty, but I'll, I'll continue to work on this map so people who are looking for network access across the country will have a, a resource to help find um, solutions for that. But do keep in mind that you want to have access, if you're going to try to use NTRIP, to either a public site in these green states, you should find one, or in the red and blue states, you may have to look for other um, paid options. I'm going to start from the beginning. Again. Yeah, good. So that's just a handy map there, and you can use, once again, your cell phone, take a picture of that, and it'll open up on a QR code or with a QR code. And if you have issues accessing the site, reach out to us, and I'm happy to share the information with you. But any folks who are listening, if you can help share information with me so I can improve the information provided by this map, I'd greatly appreciate that. And so when you're getting ready to go out and do your field or set up and do your field operation, it's always important to keep in mind what your airspace is. And this is something important to look at ahead of time before your project starts. And I do encourage everyone, of course, to always follow the local, state, and federal rules and guidelines whenever planning and conducting drone flights for mapping operations. So be sure you go through and register, not just um, checking the airspace, of course, with like before you fly, but also be sure you get a lance authorization so other aircraft will know that you're in the area. And of course, being able to fly or operate at the highest altitude available within your particular flight area is applicable because by flying at the highest possible altitude, ultimately that will help reduce the amount of data that has to be captured and then ultimately also your processing time. So the higher you can fly, the quicker that everything will go along. And so a work summary for the workflow that you want to use with a P4RTK drone is, and, and certainly there's room for, um, I don't want to say negotiation, but some variability here, but I'm a big fan of going out and setting up and measuring a single ground control point out on my project site. And that'll be the location I set up my DRTK2 base station on. 
so I use a piece of equipment called a CHC Opus X90 GPS, and that collects data that I can submit to um, Opus to capture a differentially corrected um, information. And so I'll set up, collect data with that, and then use that information I get to enter into the DRTK2 base station to establish a good known point. You can certainly set up over a point that is not known, but that will ultimately impact the quality of your um, global accuracy in the end. So once you have your GPS set up, at that point in time, you want to go ahead and connect your controller to the base station, establish a connection there, and then you'll need to go in and establish a connection between the aircraft and your controller. And then ultimately, your controller will function as a go-between, if you will, and is what transmits the data back and forth between the DRTK base station and your drone during flight to keep the RTK data flowing back and forth. The next thing we want to do then is go through and when we're starting our flight app, if you will, the Ground Station Pro RTK, the next thing we need to do is select the desired what I'll call gimbal mode or the, the kind of the flight planning mode method in the app. And so there's a few different options there and I'll get to those in just a moment. And then of course, after you've selected and have your mapping area defined, you just go ahead and fly your project as you would any other mapping project. You want to be sure you maintain that RTK signal lock during flight. And also, you keep the base and controller powered on during any battery swaps. I did a, a test mission just the other day at my house, and at the end of the first battery, when I got down to 30% or so, I had the drone come back, drone landed, was able to power the drone down, replace the battery, resume, and have the drone pick right back up and go right back to where it took off, or not where it took off from, but back where it stopped from, if you will, and resume its mission without a hitch. And so once the uh, mission is being completed, you have all your data collected. All the data for the RTK correction now at this point is baked into the images really within your um, geotags already. So you can just go ahead and process a full resolution sparse point cloud. Like in PIX4D, that'd be map, uh, mapper step one. Then I'm a big fan of still adjusting the sparse point cloud to align with ground control points. As I mentioned earlier, the vertical value that the DRTK base station is looking for if you enter one would be a ellipsoidal height as opposed to an orthometric height. And so the, that DRTK base isn't really set up quite as slickly as I'd like. And so long story short, I'll still implement and create a few ground control points or what I'll use as the term checkpoints in my project. Then I'll run my process for full resolution outputs and then ultimately check the quality of my checkpoints or validate the checkpoints to determine ultimately my project accuracy. And so we have a couple of videos here that the good folks from DGI have already created and I don't want to try to, we'll say, recreate the wheel here. So I'll just kind of bring these over and I'll share these, um, these videos with the, the team here. And of course I'm not getting audio now. You'll have to commentate. So in this case here, yeah, they're saying that you um, you want to go into the app. You could there. Oh, this is actually the this is a, a video I was going to show here in a moment. This is talking about a cloud PPK service, and this is a, a component that I still need to investigate and and look into a bit more here. I haven't had a chance to fully implement a cloud PPK correction, but there is an option built into the drone that if perhaps you're unable to establish a real-time connection out in the field, perhaps you're operating in a location that's too far away and you don't have network access at the time, the drone will collect all the data necessary for uh, the drone and your DRTK2 base station, will collect the data necessary to run through and do a PPK or post-process kinematic correction. And that's a workflow I've not been able to completely um, perfect just yet or following through on their directions. I need to work with that just a bit more. And we'll have a webinar on that functionality here in the, the coming weeks. But we're not quite there just yet. This is kind of going to show how you set up and you can log in all your different um, drones to your cloud PPK correction, create a task and go ahead and run that um, PPK solution, if you will, for your images to improve the post-processing. And it is, of course, important that you have your um, DRTK base station on both, once again, before and after your mission. It's one of those things you want to have it logging both before and after. And in this case here, yes, you need to connect your DRTK base to your remote control to pull off those, those files that need to be submitted for cloud PPK processing. 
and this is just not a, a full process that I've been able to work through yet. So we'll have a, another video on that here in the, the very near term. And then this is a location here also where you're able to then get some Rhinex files off of the, the internet for processing. And this is a video, once again, that I have links for in our presentation here, both on this slide and at the last slide of the presentation. So you'll be able to go back and watch this with the, the full sound on, if you will, if, if you'd like. But there's a couple other ones in here I kind of wanted to touch on as well. Here, that was the, the bottom one, how to use cloud PPK. And then the, the first one here we have on photogrammetry tutorial. This is kind of interesting. They show a slightly older interface showing about photogrammetry missions. And so they're talking about how you can go through and set up a polygon mission, if you will, for the drone to fly and capture high resolution imagery. When you power on the drone, you wanna go through and connect, of course, to your DRTK2 base station as they're showing here. Go into your network di diag diag diagnosis and check to make sure everything's well. Then you go into your planning. This planning here shows just photogrammetry and photogrammetry 3D. They've since increased the number of options there, and I have a screenshot I'll show you here in a moment. We'll go over the different flight options available within the Ground Station Pro RTK app. But once you um, get into this, you simply use your fingers to press within the application here to define the polygon that you're looking to create. You can move your waypoints around just by clicking or then double-clicking on them. So you click on a point, and you can click on other corner points. And you can see that the software generates a polygon based on where you click, click at. And then, of course, at the top of the screen here, it'll give you an estimated time of flight, number of photos that it anticipates to capture, and an overall area that will be captured. So once you have the polygon on your uh, map interface defined for what you want, you can specify the drone's altitude and its speed that it'll be moving while capturing. I recommend flying at slower speeds, usually about 5 to 7 miles per hour. I don't like to push it much beyond that. You can adjust your horizontal and vertical overlap. I'm a big fan of keeping my overlap at about 75, 75, or maybe in difficult terrain, maybe a little higher, 80, 80. You can set your camera settings here. Camera angle of gimbal of 90 would be straight down or what we'll call nadir. If you adjust the camera angle, it'll be slightly oblique at that point. But nadir is appropriate if you're trying to make a 2D mapping mission type of output. And if you want more of a 3D modeling kind of effect on the side of buildings, you want an oblique um, angle to your camera. And so once you've got all your par parameters set, you simply go in and hit save, add a name for your task, and at that point in time you're ready to go and you can just hit the invoke button and that will allow you to go through, do one last pre-mission check. It will upload all of your flight parameters to the drone. Drone will take off. And then you want to have the antennas oriented there as they're showing in the vertical manner so they're kind of facing the drone. And you see those blue signs radiating out. That's how those signals radiating out from the, the broad side of the drone. It's not coming out of the point of the antenna. So it's good to have those antennas up at that angle. And then yeah, they're talking here about um, keeping the drone um, remote control powered on during battery swaps and then just have the drone go back and it'll resume its mission. And then once the mission is over, the drone will automatically return. And at that point in time, you can go ahead and you can just take the SD card out of the drone and use that data on the SD card then to input into PIX4D or DGI, Terra, et cetera, for processing. And that's a screenshot there showing how to begin a processing in DGI, Terra, and we'll get to that here in just a few moments. We don't want to jump ahead too far. And then there's also an information video here that if you follow through on this tutorial link right here, it'll show you how to set up and establish that network RTK so you're leveraging that in-trip connection error correction if you don't have access to your own DRTK2 base station. And so when you get into the DJI ground station RTK, there's a number of different flight modes or camera orientations, if you will, that are available to you. You can kind of see in the background of my slide here, there's all these different graphics. You can see here, like, this is the 2D photogrammetry. Then over here, kind of more in the middle, is the 3D photogrammetry, this kind of double grid kind of option mission. 
The waypoint mission is certainly a valid mission type, but I find it to be more cumbersome and awkward to try to establish a flight area with waypoint missions because you have to define actions for each individual waypoint, whereas with the 2D and 3D photogrammetry missions, it's a little bit more automated. You're just defining a project area. The linear flight mission is great if you're doing, as the name implies, a more linear related function. You simply digitize along perhaps the center line of the pipeline or the center line of the power line easement, etc. And then you can specify how wide of an area on the right and left, if you will, of that center line that you want to map out. And it'll create then a more complex shape that matches that criteria. And it's a little bit smoother than trying to create a Poly, a very complex polygon shape, if you will. The software works really well for planning out linear flight missions. And then last but not least, they have a 3D photogrammetry, what they're calling a, ooh, I have a typo there, a multi, it's multi-oriented. And in that instance there, the camera flies around from different angles, and I'm not one of, quite as big a fan of that mode. I need to experiment with it some more and see really what it's designed for. You have some other options, of course. You can do a terrain awareness mode. And that requires the input or import of a digital surface model, or DSM, to define what the altitudes are in that area. There's also an option to do block segmentation if you're dealing with a very large project area that you're trying to subdivide into smaller projects. You, can always, you also have an option to, as they say, walk with RTK. So maybe you're out in an area where you don't have access to um, a background map to define the extent of where you're trying to map with. You could actually walk around and use the drone to kind of help you mark the corners of where you're trying to map with. And then the last two, linear flight, adjusted height, and angled flight route. I need to continue to experiment some more with those to learn better how those, light, those options can be used. But for most mapping and modeling missions, you'll find that the 2D photogrammetry or the 3D photogrammetry option is really quite ideal for planning a mapping mission. If your end goal is just a top-down orthomosaic type map, uh, for, you'll still get good contour lines and good elevation data, but you won't really get data for like the sides of structures, etc. The 2D map's really all you need with Nader imagery. If you're looking to create a more robust like 3D model virtual twin of a location, then go ahead and choose that 3D photogrammetry option. And from there also, keep in mind that you'll need to put out some checkpoints across your project. And so again, what is a checkpoint? I mean, that's a term that we may have heard and sometimes you'll forget what it is. And when you get down to it, a checkpoint is really essentially a ground control point, but the coordinate information for that point is not exposed, if you will, to the software during processing. And so once your end result is calculated, the software looks to see how close your checkpoint values came to the calculated values. And that will ultimately then report back the accuracy of your project. And even though you've invested in an RTK drone and you're supposed to be getting high accuracy data, ultimately you still need a few checkpoints are necessary even with an RTK enabled drone. And so with your GCPs or ground control points and your checkpoints, once again, the work, RTK workflow does not eliminate the need for field points. What it does is it reduces the number that you ultimately need to put down. So it does save you time in the field. It just does not completely eliminate establishing some control, ground control. So by establishing fewer GCPs, you can use a few more of your points as checkpoints for project validation. And ultimately, the RTK-enabled drone will allow, you, allow for better image positional accuracy across the scope of your entire project network, allowing for less ideal spread of control points in the project after the fact. And I know I'm as guilty of this as anybody that when I go to set out ground control points, I always have a picture in my mind of exactly how they're going to be perfectly kind of near the corners, but well set in from the edge and well distributed all across my project. But ultimately, something will come up, whether it be a highway or a river or something that you can't get maybe over to the other side and you don't get your ground control distributed as ideal as you'd like. By having that RTK enabled data when the drone was flying, you'll get away with having a more less than optimal spread of ground control points and still end up with good quality geospatial data in the end. And so some field items to consider is, of course, checkpoints are required even with RTK. Keep in mind your power access. This is something that stymies me, it seems like, on every project I'm working on. How many batteries do you have? You can't really push your battery all the way down to zero, so account for only using maybe 80% of your batteries, have access to some kind of a charging capacity perhaps in the field or just a lot of batteries. 
And it's really good to have access to some kind of charging capacity. That way you can keep the batteries for any GPSs or mobile devices or laptop computers or any other hardware you might have with you out in the field up and running. And then, of course, I'll stress the point again, SD cards, carry extra. I was just trying to do a mission the other day, and lo and behold, I'd taken the SD card out of the drone to do a processing and had failed to put it back in. I got out to the job site and ended up having to pack everything back up and go back home to get that SD card because without a way to control, without a, somewhere to write the data, there's no, you're just wasting time. And then I would strongly encourage folks to work on creating your own checklist, if you will. There are some checklists made by some other companies. One of the organizations we've worked with in the past, Aerotos, has some really good checklists. But create a checklist for your equipment preparation so you don't forget to have that SD card when you're loading it in the vehicle or maybe a cable or something like that. Then also have a pre-flight check to make sure that you've gone through and gotten your airspace clearance and that your um, unlock codes were done and that you're, you've done a full hardware check and that you know all your props are in good shape and there's no burrs or rough edges there, et cetera. And then of course, as you're packing things up at the end of the day, having a post-flight list can be super critical as well to keep you forget from forgetting perhaps some of the ground control points that you put out on the ground. Maybe you established a scale constraint and put out a tape measure, some other items. Having a good thorough post-flight checklist to make sure you've picked up and gotten all of your hardware associated, accounted for and perhaps also maybe even start to do a quick rapid um, rapid process of your data to make sure you've got sufficient coverage before you leave the field can all be things that will save you a lot of time in the end. And then so when you've gone out and you've flown the mission, you've captured your data, I want to show you an example here of what we've gotten out of DJI um, Terra and also Pix4D. Terra, I've just been playing with it for a bit. We'll have a webinar, I believe, next week, more in-depth review of what Terra is capable of. But this, what you see here on the screen, the left-hand side is showing your mission library where you can reconstitute missions up here at the top. You have a 2D, 2D multispectral, and then also 3D. And then the options down below here are really more for mission planning, such as, I think, a waypoint mission, mapping mission, the oblique mission, linear, and then an orbital option as well. And when you're submitting your data to Terra for processing, in the lower right-hand corner, you get a window information box that will pop up kind of like this that indicates what the reconstruction progress is. There's not a lot of other visual cues that come up in the software, but you do have that progress tracking bar in the corner there that shows you how, how things are processing along. So let's take a moment here and take a look at what I got out of DGI Terra from flying over my um, neighborhood here just recently. And so this would be the neighborhood here in Denver, Colorado, or actually we'll call it Greenwood Village, where I, I live and I was able to do some data collection over the past weekend here. And in this case here, I was able to set up and establish, if you will, my DRTK base station. If I zoom in here a bit, right over top of this data, you can see here the, the shadow of my RTK base station I had set up over a, a point here in my house that's a, a known point, if you will. And I got good quality reconstruction for the most part. If we go in and we look for here, I'm going to move this over, for an um, annotation and measurement data, I have here on the ground, this is a 25-foot um, tape measure. The ground right there along my driveway is not perfectly straight, but long story short, my 25-foot tape measure here came out with a measurement of 24.93, so I was seven hundredths of a foot off there, but I think that's because you can see there's a little bit of a stretch there that it doesn't quite follow along where the ground wasn't flat. But I also put out then another known scale constraint up here. This is a five foot um, sky ruler that I was using. And I can see here that I got very good um, measurements on that a, a size or horizontal distance of just 5.02. So about two hundredths of a foot off there of what I was expecting. And still good quality reconstruction. You can even make out the trim, if you will, on the bag that holds the sky ruler there. So overall got good quality reconstruction all the way around. I have not yet had time to go through and establish or check my checkpoints, if you will, in this project, but I'm very pleased with the overall quality of the reconstruction and believe that I should get very good feedback from my, my checkpoints ultimately. Everything processed quite cleanly there. I also have a copy of this data. This is the, the version I can show you here in DGI Terra. So we can see here in Terra, the vehicles in the driveway here came out really nice. I think that Toyota Prius there looks really like a Toyota Prius. 
I was a little bit surprised, if you will, that the data that I processed through PIX4D, the exact same data here, this is a 2D ortho mosaic. Once again, it looks pretty good from a, a top-down kind of perspective as it um, repopulates and um, comes in there. But when I go into my ray cloud interface, I found that there was a little bit of more variability or we'll turn on the point cloud here and turn off our cameras. Take just a moment for that point cloud to load up. We'll have this loaded here in just one moment. So as the point cloud comes up here, we can zoom in. We can see we still got good reconstruction as far as the light poles in the area came out. But we, I was a little bit surprised here at the quality of the reconstruction on the house area here. If I turn on my triangle mesh, and I'll turn off the, I'll leave it. And of course, yeah, the triangle mesh is going to struggle to load now too here probably. Whisper sweet nothings into my computer's ear here. Hopefully it behaves and doesn't crash on me. I see we have, it looks like a couple questions coming in here. I'm going to see if I can expand this out to better read them. Or can you see the questions, John? I do not have a questions box on my panel. Sorry. What elevation did you use to fly this? So in this particular project here, I um, the area that I'm at, I'm at a 400 grid here in Colorado. So I'm able to fly up as high as 400 feet. But in this particular instance here, I believe I was only flying up at about 200 feet. So I didn't fly this one quite as high. This was about 200 feet. And so as the triangle mesh loads here, yeah, if I turn off my point cloud, I was a little bit disappointed in the quality of the reconstruction. Certainly the car here still looks like, like a Toyota Prius, but it doesn't look nearly as crisp as it did in the DJI Terra software. So I need to work and experiment some more here with the um, Pix4D mapper software. I know it can do good quality work. I didn't get my best quality work there, but even over here, if I come and look at the what we'll call the pool house. If we look underneath here, the pool house just like you can see the furniture under the pool house area and even the shepherd's hook here on the pool itself. But if we go out to the DJI Terra and look at that information, it just came out much oops, too far there. Much better, I thought, that as far as the reconstruction. Just looks a little bit smoother there overall. But this is something I'm continuing to work with and um, hope to continue to improve the, the quality of the output there. So we come back here. And so when you're processing a project, say in Pix4D Mapper, the steps to get that project to process is simply go in, create a new project like normal, add in your images from the drone, and those drone images are already geotagged now with my good RTK values at, from while the drone was flying. And be sure to not leave the images on the SD card. That has caught me as well before. You want to be sure you take that SD card out, copy the images over to your computer, reformat the SD card, if you will, and have it ready for the next mission. It's critical that you keep your original images with your project for it to open up again successfully. After you've added your images, go ahead and process the project as just a standard 2D map or 3D model, whichever is appropriate, and just process it through step one. At the conclusion of step one, at that point, you can go in and mark your GCP points and re-optimize them. That'll adjust any altitude to take into account the vertical um, datum that you're using. Once again, the DRTK2 base station is really only set to take in WGS84 and ellipsoidal heights. So if you're working with a different coordinate system, ultimately it would be um, advantageous to have a few ground control points in that custom coordinate system. Then you can mark your GCP points, re-optimize, run steps two and three, and then inspect your checkpoint accuracy for your overall project accuracy. And that's really all there is to it in PIX4D. And so I have some helpful links here at the end that I think um, hopefully you'll find useful. 
The first up here at the top, we have the user manuals for the Phantom 4 RTK and also the RTK SDK variant. And for the DRTK2 base station, all three of those um, links are there. Then, of course, the DJI Assistant 2 for Phantom is the software that I strongly recommend people use to maintain the firmware on their DJI um, P4 RTK to keep it up to date and to monitor the status of that. Then there's also, oops, there's also a tutorial here, the P4 RTK photogrammetry tutorial that DJI has put out, the RTK network video tutorial, and then the P4 RTK how to use the cloud. You can follow these links, and they have they are out on the on the DGI website. I also have here the URL for my RTK resources map that I spoke about earlier. You can follow that um, URL, and um, if you find additional resources that need to be mentioned, please be sure to contact either myself or John, and we're happy to help get that map updated so we can provide the most up to date information on folks. And there's also a very handy article here about what is accuracy in an aerial mapping project by PIX4D. And this is a, a document that's really helpful to kind of understand what level of accuracy ultimately you'll get out of a project. And even if you have centimeter grade accuracy on your GPS, but you're flying your drone at an altitude such that you have, say, a one inch ground sampling distance, you'll never have a higher degree of accuracy than roughly one to three times your project GSD. And so if you're in a position where somebody is calling for super high-end accuracy, what that's gonna require is you as the pilot in command is to set your altitude of flight to capture a GSD that's at least one third smaller than what your required project accuracy is. And so that's really what's going to dictate the quality, the accuracy of your project is the resolution with which the images are captured. And then ultimately you need to have GPS data for those ground control points at such a scale or resolution that you can clearly identify that centimeter or spot you're trying to mark. And so I'm a big fan of using, as I had on a slide a couple slides ago, those um, PK or known point nails that have a little dimple on them. I have found that over time when you're setting up a GPS device, if you don't use a known point nail, you can get some variability really on ultimately what your height is. So I like to put that uh, mag nail or the known point nail on the ground with a little dimple so I can set my GPS device back up on that exact same spot this week, next week, or in two weeks from now to validate that information. And if you don't have that KP nail, you might find that if you go out on a really early morning when the ground's still kind of frosty or frozen, your GPS will sit up a little bit higher on the ground, if you will. But then when the ground has thawed a little bit, your point might go down into the duff, if you will, a bit further. And that can add a bit of variance of a half inch or an inch or so to your vertical. And anytime you can reduce or cut down on any kind of vertical errors or issues. So I try not to set my GPS up on a really big grassy open spot. I like to try to set it up on what I'll call bare open ground or a hard surface where I know I'm measuring the top of that surface and not a couple inches below the grass, et cetera. And in the long run, if you're unfamiliar with how to operate a, G a DRTK type base station, it's always good to reach out and confer with licensed surveyors in your area don't try to overstep your qualifications or skill level and say that you can capture a project that with a high degree of accuracy until you've done some practice projects to establish some ground control and you understand the full workflow that the data you're collecting is at the highest quality accuracy possible. And so I understand I didn't really go through a, like a step by step, this is how you do it, but this is really kind of a more of a find your own adventure path as you're going through. It'll depend a lot on what software it is that you're using for processing or even which drone controller you're using, whether it be the standard controller or the SDK controller. And so there'll be decision points on each path as you go down. But one of the most efficient ways to work if you're in an area that does not have access to a Wi-Fi connection where you can get that in-trip feed, then certainly you want to establish or set up your DRTK2 base station. If you are in an area where you have access to a solid Wi-Fi connection and can do a in-trip connection, the fastest way to operate would be to use a mobile device, establish that connection, and then at that point in time, you can go through and get high-quality data from that, that network, if you will. 
Otherwise, you'd just be depending on kind of one little base station that you've got set up in front of you on a point that you've recorded, and there's a few errors or areas in that workflow there are the room for errors if you enter in a wrong coordinate or maybe don't have your GPS set up properly. But if you guys do have questions on how to get the best results out of your P4RTK, please feel free to reach out to us here at Multicopter Warehouse. Both myself and John Parker are always happy to address questions. And I've been doing my best to try to follow questions along here as they, they come here. Are there other questions that we haven't addressed here? I see what elevation did you fly this by? Any other questions? Have you found an advantage to inputting coordinates for the base station location versus setting up the base at a random location and using survey GPSs in pix 4 d to establish the locations? Really, I guess the advantage there would be like, how much time you have. I mean, certainly, setting if you don't have time to establish a point ahead of time, which is often the case, you can get by with just setting it up over a unknown point, if you will. But then in that case, you do need to have ground control points. If you can set it up over a known point, ultimately, I myself, and I am not a licensed land surveyor, but from all the licensed surveyors I've spoken to in the past, I've always gotten the impression that essentially if you can't get the same answer twice, you haven't gotten the right answer once. And so it's imperative that you be able to revisit and recheck your, your measurements to validate them. And so I like to go ahead and set up a couple of ground control points in my project regardless. That would be the workflow I would suggest there. Let's see here. For some reason, I'm not able to read my my questions section here very well. Pop the box out. I'm sorry. How do you pop the box out? Or oh, there we go. That yeah, that helps. Okay. So I hear you. What is the elevation you used to fly? So once again, I was at 200 feet. I like 200 feet as well. Having found the same base station can be used for N300 and Phantom 4 RTK. Yes, that's true. Um, there used to be a, a small variance. They've done a software update, and yeah, you can use the Matrice three, um, the Matrice RTK DRTK base station or the P4 RTK. How long does the um, the base battery last for? That's a good question. I would say I've been getting the WB37 battery that comes with it. I would say I've been getting somewhere close to about six hours out of one of those batteries, if you will. It'll operate for the better part of a, a day, if you will, but there is an option for an external larger battery connection as, as an option. But also, if I was planning on working for a long time out in the field, yeah, having a couple of batteries there is a good idea. And I believe DJI recently announced they will support Trimble Rover base stations for the Phantom 4 RTK. Is the process the same, and what are the advantages or disadvantages? So I, I guess one of the advantages would be that you wouldn't need to perhaps, we'll say, like set up or have multiple pieces of equipment with the the current DRTK2 base station, you're um, a bit limited, but yeah, if, I hope they'll um, make it more compatible with Trimble, Trimble base stations. The big caveat is that you just need to have a Trimble base station or any base station that is in-trip compliant and that you can set up and have it broadcast with an in-trip kind of connection, and that's something that you can certainly use. Can you do a seminar on the workflows with arrow points? Um, we can certainly look into that. We are currently not a distributor for arrow points. We do have a, a couple around. And I've looked at and kind of played with arrow points a little bit before. Some of the pros and cons I feel about the arrow points, I'm a little bit discouraged that the the target itself, I mean, it's sitting directly on the ground. And back to my comment earlier about being able to replicate and get the same value twice. And so I wish there were some kind of like a small hole or something like that in the center of the arrow point but I have a hard time being certain that I'm setting it up on the exact same spot. I understand they give you a template, if you will, that you can kind of spray paint around and mark where you put the arrow point on the ground. But ultimately, I'm not sure if that's as accurate as being able to set up a range of GPS on a 1.8 or 2 meter range pole right over a KP nail. But um, certainly reach out to us. Um, I think it's Catherine Unger, and I'd be happy to, to work with you to explain the, the workflows with um, arrow points. Excellent. Well, that's really all the material I have here. Are there any other questions we might be able to work with? Can, yeah, and I'll yeah, do some information on the arrow points there. And super. 
Well, if there's no other questions at this time, we'll go ahead and well, I know this webinar is a week later or an hour later than they were previous week, so we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. This webinar will be published and available for folks on the um, internet here, I believe, tomorrow. And if you have any questions or comments, we hope you'll reach out to us. We're always happy to help. So have a great week, and next week we'll be talking more in depth about DGI Terra. Have a great day, everybody.